Excellent, great to have you here. This is your first con, I gather. Yes, certainly my first. Uh, so it, technically my, my second, I suppose. I did, um, I did, I did a warm-up con to, to, to get ready for this one. I thought <laughs> it would be, it would be uh, remiss not to prepare. Uh, so I did the um, Scarborough Sci-Fi um, Festival about a month ago, just a, a, a little one in, uh, up in Scarborough, which is fabulous. Mm. Um, but this, this is the main act. This is, I feel like that was a little warm up and now we're up and running at a full size count at XL no less and to take us back how did you actually manage to get involved in the first place with the with the whole Harry Potter film series uh, I let's think so I was uh, my agent I was contacted by my agent uh, at the time um, the phone call that every actor wanted at the time obviously um, he got a casting for Harry Potter um, she was very good though she said don't get excited John just see it as a chance to meet a very good casting director. Don't think about getting the job. Don't think about anything beyond it because you'll just you'll freak out, you know, any actor would. So just go along. It's going to be very informal. Um, and yeah, so I took, her, I took her, her words to heart and did really just kind of turn up. And it was a really, it was a really nice casting. There was no, uh, I didn't see any other actors there. They made me a cup of tea. That's very unusual at casting. <laughs> There's normally 20 other actors and no tea. Um, and she just, I think I was asked to tell a story about uh, a previous dark character that I may have played, and I played loads, so it was really easy. I was like, oh, I can do that. So I told her about a couple of um, bad guys I'd played, and that was it. And it was like, lovely to meet you, John, thank you. We'll be in touch. Three months later, I had completely forgotten about that casting. Because of my agent's advice, I had just gone into, I got to meet Fiona Weir, that's enough for me. And I was, my mum was visiting London from Yorkshire, and I was out with my mum and my wife, and we were, um, I think we'd gone to Kingston. Anyway, we were, we were doing charity shopping, going around the charity shops, looking for bargains. Phone call from my agent, I step outside, and she says, um, you've, you've got a recall. It's like, for what? You know, for Harry Potter. It's like, Harry Potter? I'd literally forgotten I'd even had the casting. So then, uh, yeah, ran back in, told my mum, um, but I got the recall. She also, she actually said, you've got, you've got, you're definitely playing a Death Eater. They just don't know which one. So you now need to go and meet David Yates, and he's going to decide which one you're going to play. That was a weird phone call and an exciting day. So yeah, it was, and it was, it wasn't like any other casting I've had. It was very. People also say, how could you forget that you auditioned for Harry Potter? But I, I really did. That three, that three month gap, and my agent, and yeah. So it was quite a mind bender. So that's what you hadn't read any scripts, you hadn't, yeah. I'd literally not given it any thought, you know. I, 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 I knew my agent, what she was saying was very sensible, you know. You don't want to spend the next, however, just like every day getting up thinking, I think it'll ring today. Yeah. Uh, it's, you know, that's the torture for an actor. So I had literally just gone in, had this chat, left and forgot about it, thinking oh, that's unlikely to happen. So made it all the sweeter to get a phone call saying, um, yeah, no, you've definitely been cast as a Death Eater, we just don't know which one yet. Um, and the, sec the second audition was very sweet, because they sent a car for me, so I was picked up, driven to Leavesden, um, met David Yates, who was absolutely lovely, thanking me for coming in, like I wouldn't go in. <laughs> <laughs> Still, nice to be thanked. Um, yeah, and then he, um, uh, yeah, he got me to do the, the, the train stopping move, and was doing the old, you know, how's that gonna look on camera? Um, which was a special moment, and David Yates do that while I, <laughs> while I do this, thinking, yes, raise your arm, what's this about? Um, yeah, and then, and then was, was, was then cast as that Death Eater, which I didn't realize at the time, you know, was so, it was such a, um, a kind of really lucking out, really, being that train stopping Death Eater, having that memorable little scene. Because a lot of the other guys who were cast as Death Eaters and then given their specific roles, less featured. Um, so, and, lucky um, me. Do you have any sort of memorable moments on the set? Like, is there one memory that really stands out? Uh, breaking the door on the Hogwarts Express was quite memorable because that was terrifying. Uh, it turned out to be fine. So um, you don't quite see it, but as it just as it cuts from from me there, then it cuts into the train uh, on one of the kids, and you hear a bang. And that's, that's my Death Eater slamming the train door open. And they said, you know, slam the door, he's getting their attention. So I'd, I'd done about three takes and I'd been slamming the door. I hadn't paid any attention as to what the bang was, what was hitting what. I, I just slammed the door. It was actually the actual door handle hitting the actual luggage compartment. 
There was no stop. It's on about the fourth take. They said, they said action. I slammed the door and it didn't stop. It just kept on going. Uh, and there was a weird sound, not a bang. But <laughs> so I carried on doing the take, walking down the carriage, looking for Neville. But all the time I'm thinking, <laughs> beep, 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 beep. What, what's going to happen when I get back? You know, uh, oh, I'm just broken the Hogwarts Express. Uh, when I got back, they said cut and immediately lovely first AD just said, you know, John, can we just step you off? Really sorry about the door. Just step off for two minutes. So a couple of guys rush on who I recognized as, you know, chippies. I heard I barely drank the tea, stepped back on and they fitted two amazing buffers like with felt on and everything. Like as good a job as you do at home. Um, and then the first AD went, okay, John. And he slammed the door as hard as he could about five times to prove that I can slam it and then said, carry on. So that was impressive. I went from being very scared to being very impressed in about a minute and a half. And did you end up taking anything away from the set on the Harry? <laughs> I don't know. It's so sad. I did. I took. I, I managed to keep one thing, and it was my my thermal underwear, the top <laughs> half of the thermal underwear. It's not even. It doesn't even have anything in it. You only have my word for it that that it was actually from the set, and that's the only thing. But I, I wanted the costume because it was m made to measure. You know, and it's hung somewhere in a in a costume department, getting dusty. When I could be wearing it, it's not the Harry. House. It's not the Harry Potter experience, of at least. I don't know. I don't know. My train's there. I know my tra my train <laughs> recently arrived. So uh, yeah. Have you been to see it? I haven't yet. No, I do intend to. Uh, that and, uh, and my wand. Yeah. And very important question: Which Hogwarts house are you in? I'm a Slytherin. Obviously. <laughs> All the best. All the best. <laughs> Slytherin. Yes. My costume is on a mannequin. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very proud of that. It's a, it's a, with my wig and all the other stuff that I didn't manage to steal. Have you taken the family to see it? Oh, I went. Me, me and Warwick Davis are a terrible pair of whores, and uh, <laughs> we went up to the um, to the opening. They did two openings at, um, at the uh, the Wizarding World of Harry Potter. The first one was the was like the day before on the Thursday, and it was for the mayor of Watford and uh, and all of Watford Town Council. And because me and Warwick are a pair of whores, we got paid some money to be the. They wanted some people from the car, so we turned up in matching suits and showed everybody round and met the mayor. And it, but it was so what we had a sort of advantage. And then two days later, they did the big one where they flew all the execs over from uh, from Hollywood and you know and that was we all stayed at the Grove Hotel and had this big flash thing but me and Warwick had already done it you know so like, oh yeah, yeah it's been there done, <laughs> done that one but what I did do is I my um, one of my best friends has got two kids that were the perfect age of like sort of a five and seven and they were literally the last to leave you know you see the impact that they that, that the kids have there it was a really it was a, it was a I strongly recommend it as a day out and the only perk that we get as being in it is uh, you know, it, it, you can you can jump the queue a little bit if you want to get friends in. You, they're very. They're, Warner Brothers have been great, so I phone up and say, "Look, I've got some friends from from out of town. They want to go." Okay, because it's it's so popular. Yeah, you know, yeah. there's like massive list, but there's no sort of freebies. But it's a great. I think you know, as a day out, when you see the effect that it has on the on the kids that were there, it's like, oh, wow, there's like a more informed, I think, more educational than a trip round Thorpe Park. You know. Absolutely. Have you been to any conferences before, and what has the experience been like? Have you um, yeah. Oh wow. I had the, the the king of all conferences, which uh, I went to the um, uh, to Orlando, Flor Florida, for the uh, to Universal Studios when they did the launch of the DVDs, and it was my mum's seventieth. So I took her as my guest, which was just brilliant. They you know they they sort of flew us all out and treated us like royalty, and that was fantastic. And if you one of the many things about what's amazing about uh, JK is, uh, is she didn't want a theme park. She, I mean, these are serious books, and you know I'm not turning it into a theme park. And uh, not everybody, at, uh, you know, uh, at Warner's and at Universal, saying, well, you know, we really want this. <sighs> okay, you can have a theme park, but I want my designer, um, uh, what's it, Sean Christie. I want, I want uh, him to design it. He's an Oscar-winning designer. He doesn't do theme parks. <laughs> and it's, it's all right, okay, <laughs> I'll do it. But I want to bring my construction team in. And my, so this, the the uh, the Orlando Har Harry Potter went oh, massively over budget, massively over schedule. But when you go there, it's amazing. It's like being on the set. It's like yeah. being back at the original stuff in in Leeds. And it the, the the standard of, of it is is just jaw dropping. But, but they took. All of us out. It was great, you know. And uh, 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 of the grown-ups, it was like, you know, 
uh, Jason Isaacs and David Thewlis and, and me and Mark Williams and all the rest of them. So we had there was a, there was a sort of there was a bunch of grown ups that had their sort of wives or mums with them, and uh, and then you know the, the rest of the team. That was terrific. That was by far the you know you couldn't want for better than that. It was brilliant. It was absolutely brilliant. Were there any favourite costumes that you saw? Um, I saw a great fill, fill the bag shot today. Wearing <laughs> snake around her neck. <laughs> oh no, I like the idea of people dressing up as me, but they always look a little when they do they're dressing up as Scavia. But um, you know, but they don't know that I was trying to look like Adam Ant. So you know, <laughs> so that was uh, that. That's always that's always fun. But, um, and I, I've, ne I've never seen anyone do anything that didn't actually look quite cool. You know, what I mean, no one, no one, no one dresses up for those events and fails. It's always, you know, they always look actually quite, quite cool, or you know, like, like you know, in the spirit of things. Do you think the Death Eater costumes always look cooler than the other ones? You know, it's always I think bad guys are just getting yeah, the best outfits. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> on the on, I think the the day I went in for my costume fitting, the first costume fitting, there was there was some other. Some other Death Eaters were just coming out, and I knew one of them, an actor called Mark, and he was wearing a, a, his Death Eater costume, and 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 his was much more kind of um, perfunctory, like a, like a foot soldier kind of look, a little bit, you know. And I remember thinking, and thinking, oh, I was hoping to be a little bit more regal than that. And then when I saw mine, mine was like the <laughs> Prince of Death Eaters, you know, 100% silk down to the ground, cloak and amazing padded quilted with stitching all around it completely different to the others so i think i lucked out with a well, very i worked with jenny before and she's a friend of mine and i was actually disappointed that she didn't get an oscar nomination i thought certainly for the last two films i thought that the costume designs were amazing i mean she's brilliant she's done yeah. now she's on she's just done the new bond she's done she does you know she's gone from from Harry Potter to James Bond, so she's you know she's she's doing all right. But I really thought that she that it should have got a mention. I thought some of the costume designs were, were spectacular, but certainly in the you know in the last two films, brilliant. And is that in any way? Do you think because in in some circles it was perceived as being a children's book? Yeah, there's always an element of that which takes away from the the skill set that, that goes on. You know, the, the standard of the. Um, I thought I I thought Alan Rickman should have got maybe got a nomination for supporting actor for the Half Blood Prince because he was um, he was uh, he was brilliant in it and I think sometimes it, there is a stigma of oh yeah it's a kids franchise and you, and it isn't you know they're all they're absolute experts at the best of their game you know with the design certainly with the design aspects of it um, so yeah I think you're right you're right to think that <laughs> yeah because certainly an incredible attention to detail. You know, which, oh, which yeah. belies the fact that it's, you know, in some circles people saying well, it's just a kids' film, and, yeah. and yet you know, the attention to detail was phenomenal. Yeah. And last question: so Do you both of you do you have one memory that kind of sticks with you from doing the films that you're allowed to share? <laughs> I think I think the most interesting thing for me was my uh, I was directing a film at the same time as as acting in the in the. Uh, Deathly Hollows Part One, and so it was a big, it was a big hoo ha about um, whether I'd be able to do both things. But I was like, no, no, no. First, the first few days were all night shoots, so I was sort of directing during the day and then, <laughs> then filming in the evening. It was like it was ridiculous. But but I, when we got on set, especially uh, as you'll know, you know, when you do the outside location stuff, so much of it is done in the studio. It's all very insular and they move at their own pace. When Harry Potter goes on the march, it's like, you know, it is an army. It's like incredible. The, the amount of people that come, the second unit is as big as, as, as a massive studio yeah, film. Yeah, uh, when I stopped the train, there's me and a hundred crew. A hundred crew behind that camera when I, when I stopped that train. So, yeah. It's terrifying. So, so, uh, but I remember turning up with the uh, Burnham beaches of the, in the woodlands, and you literally got out of the car, and there's a fleet of, of, of production vehicles, and hundreds of people running around. And then you've got, you've got the costume and makeup, and then you got into some Land Rover that took you to another place, and it was like, and this is the, you know, this is the, the uh, telemic unit where you can see all the monitors of, blah, 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 and right, then you're going to get in another car which drove you through the woods, this other place, and then eventually you s it whittles down to, right, then you go and see Peter and, and Emma are up there for the scene, and we, you walked through this whole woodland that was lit from uh, with lamps, Moscow's, which are giant lights that, that do that film. It's night, but it looks like you can see, you know. But you literally parked the, the truck a mile away with a great big, literally a mile away with some lamps on it. 
So the whole thing is like, you know, like an invasion. And then when you actually walked up to the, where we shot the rehearsal and shot the scenes, the scene where she's, Emma's invisible and I'm, you know, and, and, and I, I can smell her in the, in the woods. It was just me and her and the director and the camera going around in a circle. But there was this massive paraphernalia. So by the time you get through all of that, you're like, what? But then it just goes down to basics, which is just two actors and a camera. And, and that was lovely. That was like, oh, right, I can deal with this. This is, I'm used to this, two actors and a camera. That's okay. The rest of it, I've got no idea, you know. I couldn't, <laughs> why, why are there a thousand people in the woods? Why are there, <laughs> you know, I'm going to go into a scene in a minute. But when you get there, it actually, my abiding memory was the fact that it all boils down to something quite simple. You know? Same old thing, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's just, you know, it's just people doing, telling a story in front of, and a camera happens to be there. You know? Mine's really, I have, because it's my first big feature film, so I was coming from independent, low budget stuff to the biggest production in the world at the time. So. Almost everything I looked at, I was just like, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god. <laughs> However, seeing, uh, there's a scene in Malfoy Manor, uh, I'm dead, uh, everyone's dead on the floor, um, Voldemort's killed everyone. Uh, there was a take where um, they had blood on the floor and uh, they didn't realise that Rafe was going to slip on it, so I got to see Rafe Fiennes slide. <laughs> you, know, you, know, you, know when you're, you know when you're going to fall over, you should just fall. Just, just, just get bum on the floor as quick as possible, because if you try to save yourself, you can just perpetually flail. <laughs> uh, and I saw Rafe in full costume flailing for about a minute and a half <laughs> right along this bloodline and then managed to keep his balance and then they have to... Oh, yes, he's got so, he's so not poised. Just all, this, just like all these dead bodies all just sat half up, just what, just like this. Just <laughs> as, as Rafe, just... Hey, what, 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 what. Speaking in parcel song is what I mean. <laughs> so that will stay with me forever. I can't unsee that. <laughs> <laughs> well, well that'd be an outtake that he was going to it must I, yeah. it must it, at some point it's got to come out because it was hilarious <laughs> I don't think they shall be cut gents thank you very much indeed that's been fabulous ladies and gentlemen you're watching hey you guys hey you guys huh hey you guys, yeah. is that from the Goonies it is indeed yeah. nice hey